Turn with me this morning to 1 Samuel chapter 22. First Samuel chapter 22, verse 1 and 2, and then we're going to go over to First Chronicles. That'll be right a few pages, several pages to the right, to the First Chronicles chapter 12. But First Samuel chapter 22, good to have all of you in the house of God today. I want to preach to you on this thought, making Jesus our King. Making Jesus our King. Jesus is a lot, to a lot of people, a lot of different things. When you talk to a world that says they're saved or they begin to tell you that they're born again or whatever, the longer you talk to them, you wonder who they are. You wonder who they even belong to. You know, some people tell you, I love Jesus. And you say, you love Jesus? Tell me about your Jesus. When they get done, you go, Jesus who? If you remember back, I think it was in 95, that's been a long time ago, I preached a message in this church on Jesus who. You ask a Muslim who Jesus is, and they'll tell you he was a nice prophet, a good prophet, but Allah is God. Ask a, you know, a Jehovah's Witness who Jesus is, they'll have a whole nother definition. Ask one of the Mormons, they'll give you another one. And, and sad to say, ask some of the people who call themselves Christians or evangelicals who Jesus is. And when they get done, you go, Jesus who? Well, let's, let's talk about this today, making Jesus our King. Father, I count it a privilege to be in your house. Thank you for the honor, the privilege of being a part of reaching a lost world. Thank you for the Judsons that gave their very life, that sowed in tears, that planted seeds into that harvest field. And God, we've been able, to, or others have through the years, to go and water. And now, God, you are bringing the increase. They that plant, they that water are nothing. It's God that brings the increase. Thank you for the privilege of sowing, the privilege of watering, and the, and the greater privilege that I get to meet them on streets of gold when we see you face to face. Make Christ real to us today, I pray. Amen. Chapter 22, verse 1. David therefore departed thence, and he escaped to the cave Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him. And he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. Now let's go over to First Chronicles. I'm going to be preaching out of this whole chapter. But I'm just going to kind of jump around on verses so that we're not here all day today. Just most of it. Chapter 12, 1 Chronicles, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. 12, 1 and 2. Now these are they that came to David to Ziglag, while he yet kept himself close because of Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the mighty men, helpers of the war. They were armed with bows and could use both the right and the, the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows out of a bow, even of Saul's brethren of Benjamin. Verse 8. And of the Gadites, there separated themselves unto David, excuse me, and to the hold, to the wilderness, men of might, men of war, fit for the battle, that could handle shield and buckler, whose faces were like the faces of lions, and were as swift as the rose upon the mountains. Verse 14. These were the sons of Gad, captains of the host. One of the least was over a hundred, the greatest over a thousand. These are they that went over Jordan in the first month when it had overflown all his banks, and they put to flight all them of the valleys, both toward the east, and toward the west. There came 
of the children of Benjamin and Judah to the hold unto David. And David went out to meet them and answered and said unto them, If you become peaceably unto me to help me, mine heart will be knit unto you. But if you come to betray me to my enemies, see him there is no wrong in mine hands. The God of our fathers look thereon and rebuke it. Then the Spirit came upon Amasai, who was chief of the captains, and he said, Thine are we, David, and on thy side, thou son of Jesse. Peace, peace be unto thee. Peace be to thine helpers, for thy God helpeth thee. <clears throat> then David received them and made them captains of the band. And there fell some of Manasseh to David when he came with the Philistines against Saul to battle. But they helped them not, for the lords of the Philistines, upon advisement, sent him away, saying, He will fall to his master, Saul to the jeopardy of our heads. Verse 21, And they helped David against the band of the rovers, for they were all mighty men of valor, and were captains in the host. For at that time, day by day, there came to David to help him, until it was a great host, like the host of God. And, there are the, and, there, and these are the numbers of the bands that were ready armed to the war and came to David to Hebron to turn the kingdom of Saul to him, according to the word of the Lord. Drop down to verse 31. And of the half-tribe of Manasseh, 18,000 which were expressed by name, to come and make David king. And of the children of Israel, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what God ought to do. The heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. Of Zebulun, such as went forth to battle, expert in war with all instruments of war, 50,000 which could keep rank. They were not of a double heart. Verse 38, all these men of war that could rank, keep rank came with a perfect heart to Hebron to make David king over Israel. And all the rest also of Israel were of one heart to make David king. Amen. What, what it took, as we've read here, what it took in this Old Testament to make him a king is very clearly a type of our New Testament king, the Lord Jesus. David, we know, was a fugitive. Let's look then at how he became a crown king. A fugitive, nine years of, of bitter persecution of David's life are exchanged for 40 years of a glorious triumph. We ask many times ourselves, how can this be the will of God? But God, is God preparing us for something in the future? Absolutely. I said, absolutely. Whatever you have faced, whatever you have gone through as a Christian, God Himself, I'm not saying does it, but will allow it. All of it in preparation for, for a life beyond the grave, to spend eternity with Him. We see that in the loyalty of David's suffering, soldiers who so faithfully fought to win for David the high crown of Israel. And may God this morning, in this last day, continue to call men and women to follow our rejected and crucified master outside the camp in reproach and suffering to win for him the crown of all the world, then you and I will sit down with Him on His throne, even as He sat down with His Father upon His throne. There is no other reason that you and I exist. You're not here for yourself. You were created by God. I was created by God to serve God, to live for God, and for no other reason to be born again and Jesus to be my Savior and my Lord. Then in my lifetime, I owe this Christ to a lost 
in a dying world. Everyone you win to Christ is putting a, a jewel into that crown of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The story is told of the proud Napoleon that he refused to be crowned by human hands. But with his own arrogant fingers, Napoleon placed upon his own brow the crown of what he designed as the world's last empire. And he stood before a world, a self-made monarch. We see it in the G20 this week. All of the big superstars of the world, this great leader, that great leader, that great leader, all of them being uh, shown as some type of a superstar of the world. Let me tell you, saints of God, they're only pointing to a star that is a, an anti-Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is pointing to the real star. The real star this morning is you that are born again of the Spirit of God, that your sins have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. We're going to sit with Him. We're going to rule with Him. We're going where He is, and you're not going to get there without coming by the way of Jesus Christ. Our own blessed Lord and Savior, while he himself could have well conquered his own kingdom without any help of any of his followers, but he chooses to take it from our loving hands and to permit us to share with him in his suffering and his glory. Christ could have called thousands of angels to rescue him at Calvary. When they come to arrest him the one time, you remember when they come to arrest him, they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. And they all fell to the ground. What he was saying is, you're not coming to arrest me. I'm surrendering to you. I have power and authority to lay this body down. I got power to pick it back up again. What he's saying to you and I, I could have made me a kingdom without any of your help, but I chose you to crown me as king. Hallelujah. Our own blessed Savior, David, before he was ever a king, was a fugitive from Saul, and, he, and, and his court was a cave of Adullam. His followers were the outcasts of Israel. You and I can see that Jesus, our king today, is yet a king without his crown, still driven outside that camp, rejected by the world, and followed by a faithful few to whom he is still saying, You are those who have stood by me in my trials. Luke 22, 28 and 29, Jesus said, You are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me. There is no other way to have God's authority on this earth than for Christ himself, for us to surrender to him and him to give us the power and authority to become sons of the living God. Let's look at these men this morning that helped make David a king since it's such a type of, of Christ becoming our king. These, these men, let's look at them, how they, were, how they helped to make David king. May you and I be a people of one mind to make Jesus king of our life. I can tell you this morning, church, if he's not the ruler of yours in my life, if he's not Lord of our life, he will not be Lord at all. He is Lord of all or not at all. If he's not in charge of your thoughts, your will, your desires, if it's not surrendered to him as the king of your life and mine, I'll never rule with him in, in eternity. He has to be Lord. First of all, these men that followed David, number one, they were sinful men. They were outcast men. They were men without a character, without a reputation. They were men in debt and deep discredit. They were men under a cloud and without any hope. 
These kind of people were driven to the side of David in the caves and the mountains of Judah. I read it to you that the Bible said all of these kind of people, they went seeking out David. David didn't seek them. They sought for David. They're looking for, for a man that they could make a king. David accepted them, listen to me this morning, not because they were bad men, but because David knew they were true to David, and he trained them. He lifted them up to his own level, and afterwards David made them his princes, his commanders in the kingdom of Judah and Israel. Even though they were sinful men, they were a rejection of society, a rag tag team if you please but David took them in because David knew I can train them I can make them what I want them to be listen to me this morning our Lord is calling to his side choosing for his kingdom this morning not the mighty not the famous of the earth nor always the good because he knows what he can make of you hallelujah hallelujah Nothing worse than to save somebody out of a sports world or Hollywood. And all they talk about is their sports world and their Hollywood. Or how they still sing and perform where they once got saved in and saved out of. They stay there. Why? They never submit to Christ being king. They never let Christ be Lord of that life. And they never are trained to be what Christ wants them to be. That's why most of them go back to what they were. They never change into what you are this morning. Why? God reached out out and snatched you out of your drug scene, out of your perverted scene, out of your pornography, out of your perversion, and saved your wretched soul. And he said, I'll make you what I want you to be. I'll bring you up to what I want you to be. Nobody may count on you, but I'm counting on you this morning. You may be a throwaway to society, but he said, I chose you to come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me. I'll give you rest. Hallelujah. But he hath chosen, the Bible said, the weak, the foolish things, and the despised things, and the things that are not. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 and 8. What's he saying? The things that are not, the foolish, the weak, the despised, and the things that are not, because what you're not, I'll make you. Hallelujah. I'd have never chose me, but he did. And if he chose you, if he picked you, Dave Maffei, he'll qualify you. I don't care what people say, family say, what people criticize you about your past. If he picked you, I'll change you into what you're not. Hallelujah. What you're not, you'll never be. Only Christ can make you that. Only Christ, Ginger, can put a humbleness in that heart to wash the feet of a missionary. First time in Armenia. Worst conditions a man could ever live in, I thought, especially leaving California. I never knew what it was really to ever live without running water, electricity. You all know the conditions. We climb on a tree stump and then go through an open window to our bedroom. And the facilities were absolutely ridiculous. You went till you smelt something and that's where the bathroom was. And I'm not exaggerating one ounce. You took a bath. If you could get a rag wet somewhere, that was your bath. But I remember complaining, whining the whole time I was there. And I remember the last night, I was in the same room with Darren and I and Brother Wayne Romick, our dear missionary to Mexico, one of the finest Cajun men you're ever going to meet on this planet. I'd hear him pray every night. He was in a little room next to ours. Pray, I'm telling you what a praying man Brother Romick was. 
But the last day we were there, here come the lady of that house, our Arvatisa's mom. She's about that tall. Seemed looked like she is 80, probably only 65. But because the years had so worn in the, in the conditions, she'd come with a dishpan, climbing through that window with that dishpan. And here she comes through that window, and I'm looking at her. And I said to Romy, he said, what's she doing? I said, she's going to give you a bath. He said, no, she ain't. She's rattling something in Armenian, and I thought, my God, how do I tell her I don't need a bath? I need one, but I don't want her to give it to me. But she climbed through that window, cry, tears running down her cheeks. I thought she was crying and, and talking in Armenian, but she was talking in tongues. She sat down in front of Darren, put that dish plant pan in front of his feet, told him, get them shoes off. She began to wash his feet, speaking in another language. I said, my God, the presence of God began to fill that little room. Pretty soon, here she come. I pulled my pants up, got my shoes and socks off, put them in that bucket. I'm telling you why. Because the glory of God had filled that house when she got to Romig, he's talking in another language. The Spirit of God come down. Why? There's a humbleness there. There's a true work of God that brings that to my life and to yours. And only God can do it. The king has even chosen the most worthless, the most helpless, sinful of our race to be the special objects of his mercy and the prized jewels of his crown. Think about it. He's going to use you to crown his own crown. Who, me, a worse sinner than probably anybody in here? Yes! No matter how, what kind of a sinner you are or have been, he'll use you to crown himself. Hallelujah. My God. God takes the worst of the worst and he turns them back to their true sinner. And there is still, I said, there is still power in the blood of Jesus Christ. My God. There's still power in the blood of Jesus Christ. There's still power in His blood. Power in the Spirit of the living God. Not only to blot out your sin and mine, but to transform your character and mine. To make us a jewel for His own crown. My God. Paul said... This one thing I do. Why? Think about it. Paul's a murderer. Paul has clapped and applauded and shouted victory over saints of God as they slaughtered them, burned them at a stake. He led a many a women like you, a many a Christians like you, to their death. And he shouted and said, I dare you to love this Jesus now. Your head's coming off. I'm going to kill you. You're done. Paul was a man that did that. But Christ on the road knocked him off of that horse, laid him in the dirt, and he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. What he's saying is, you're standing there kicking a thorn bush. It's only hurting you. It's only pricking you, Paul. You know the story. He had the whole thing of his restoration, salvation. God delivered him. Then he gets to Philippians as he's writing the book of Philippians. Probably from a jail cell. And he said, this one thing I do, one thing I do, I'm forgetting those things that are behind. What's behind you, Paul? I was a murderer. I was worse than the worst. But he reached down and saved me. And I'm forgetting those things that got me in the mess I was in. And I'm pressing towards the mark of what I used to kill people for. 
I'm pressing towards the mark of the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. There's something to forget, but there's something to press for. And the Holy Ghost said to tell you, if you're going to hold on to your past, you'll never have a future. You've got to let her go. You don't know what I've been through. No, I probably don't. I just know what Jesus went through for you. <sighs> Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, if it's possible, can I get out of this? He said, you can, but Richard Royal go to hell. Darren Downs will go to hell. Robert Frias will go to hell. He said, no, 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 no. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You think he ought to be our king? My God, it breaks my heart. We even have an empty chair this morning. He's my king. What would their interest you beyond him being your king? Don't let your sinful sinfulness keep you back. Don't let your misery discourage you. Don't let your failures crush you. Hear me, church. Leave your sinfulness at that altar. Leave your misery at that altar. Leave your crushed life at that altar. Crush your past with a future at an altar. Hallelujah. One drop of His blood will wash you clean. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how deep in sin. I don't care how many abortions you've had. One drop of His blood will blot it out. Hallelujah. Somebody in here, you were a part of a murder and nobody has ever known it. And hell has told you since you come to God. God does not forgive of that. The devil's a liar. The devil's a liar. If you repented, the blood has been applied to your murder. Do you think he ought to be your king? God. Oh, God. Others may have failed you. You may have failed yourself. Hope may be gone. All may seem to be lost this morning. But there's one that will still receive you. I don't care who betrayed you. Who done you dirty? Who ripped you off? Who left you without and to left you for nothing laying in the dirt crying? I'm telling you, Christ said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. The only reason you were left that way, he wants to be number one. Hallelujah. Wow. One drop of his blood will make you pure. One touch of the master's hand can move you from a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of God's dear son. Number two, we got time. They were true men. Wow. One great quality of their lives was that they loved David and they were loyal to him. I think it was Steve Aguilar I was with in Tehachapi when he was preaching to the inmates. He read, I think, from David, the scripture from David telling Solomon, Solomon, be a man. Be a man. Don't be a boy no more. Be a man. And he was Steve. He challenged the inmates. You've been everything. You've tried everything. Now it's time to be a man. These men were true men. Hallelujah. 
One great quality of their life was they loved David and were loyal to him. When they first came to him, David was suspect of their motives. Who wouldn't be? He looked them in the eye and he said, If you've come to me in peace to help me, I'm ready to have you unite with me. But if you've come, to betray me to my enemies when my hands are free from violence. May the God of our fathers see it and judge all of you. Scared the liver out of them. Why? Because David knew God. And they knew David knew God. They answered David, We're yours, David. <laughs> all yours, buddy. We are with you, David, son of Jesse. Peace, peace, success, success to you, David. Success to those who help you, for, the, for your God will help you. They knew David, knew God. Church, no matter how lost a man may be, there's one thing that will always bring a link of hope to know God. That is the simple quality of true sincerity. If the worst men of men would look into your face and with an honest look and an earnest heart and say, God knows and you know that I want to be true, then church, there's hope for that person. There is salvation for that person. Had a person the other night talk to Pastor Dave and I, said, I want to look you in the eye. I want to be a man's man. I want to tell you the truth. And from the bottom of his heart, he did. I looked him back in the eye. I said, sir, let me tell you, you're a man's man. It takes a man to say what you said and do what you did. You're never going nowhere until you face the facts with a true sincerity. I don't care how many times I've been tried and tested and failed. But if I walked up to Jack Stecker and said, Brother, I want to look you in the eye. I don't want to fail. I don't want to start over again. I'm so sorry, but I want you to help me. You're an elder. You're a man of experience. Would you stand with me so I can get back where I once was? Let me tell you, only a fool would not do that. Only a fool would reject that. But it has to be a true, sincere heart. Not a conning, manipulating heart. David knew what they were. He knew they had conned him in a heartbeat. He knew they had manipulated him in a heartbeat. He knew they had blamed their grandma or grandpa for all their hang-ups. They had blamed somebody for their hang-ups. He looked them in the eye and he said, Are you going to betray me? No, David. Success, success. Peace, peace, David. Your God's with you. And if we join you, we'll be a part of the pie. Isn't this good? You can see what it took to make Jesus king. All the resources of God's grace and strength are on his side. But a traitor, a double-hearted man, a man with a reservation... A man that in back of all of what he is pretending to be is seeking his own interest in his selfishness. Saints, you hear me. He ultimately will betray himself. And he will sting himself to death like the scorpion. I read. I don't know how they know. Much as they love insects and animals, they probably got it figured out, I'm sure. But I read where it says a scorpion spends its entire life stinging its enemy. Stinging and stinging. It is so selfish, but it stings everything. I was in Arizona about a year and a half ago preaching. And I sat down in that hotel room on the bed. And I looked over and I said, something coming in my door from outside. And he'd come up like this and then turned to flip and landed and it was a scorpion. I said, no, no, me and you aren't sharing this room. I don't care what all the earth lovers say or the insect lovers say. My house shoe's crushing you, pal. So I killed Mr. Scorpion. 
Because I had already read, they spend their entire life stinging everybody they can sting. And at the end of their life, they curl themselves up. And they sting themselves to death. That's the epitome of selfishness. Selfishness is a curse. All you talk about, all you think about is yourself. I've been talked to this way. I was looked at this way. They didn't say this to me. They didn't hug me. They didn't love me. They didn't be nice to me. They didn't this to me. They didn't that to me. You're so busy with yourself. If you'll quit stinging everybody and stop curling yourself up, stinging yourself to death and say, I don't care if Robert don't love me or not, he's getting a sweaty hug. Ha <laughs> ha. And if Trudy don't like to hug a man, she's in deep trouble because she's getting a hug. And if Becky wants to run, I'll chase her down the aisle and give her a hug. Why? Because I love everybody. I love people. I love everybody of every race, every kind. Because why? Jesus Christ died for me. He loved me before I was ever born, when I was unlovable. And he put a love in my heart. And if you want to be delivered from selfishness, start loving people. i got to move on. I'll be there all day. And we don't have all day. Number three. These men were brave as well as true. I like it. They were not afraid of danger. Flood nor foe could stop them. Their faces, the, the Bible said, were as the face of lions. Can you imagine? Face of a lion? That means you're going to get hurt. King of the jungle. I'm not afraid of nothing. You want to know why Manny Ramirez on the Dodgers is such a great hitter? He don't have an ounce of fear at home plate. He digs in there in baggy pants, too big a shirt, hair hanging clear down to his waist, digs in there, looks out there and says, I dare you. He ain't afraid of nothing. And if you're not afraid of the ball, you can hit a ball. If it's 98 or 110, you can hit a ball. Manny Ramirez is probably the greatest hitter in baseball today because he has no fear. I can watch him. I used to catch. I watch hitters come to a plate. I could see a jelly leg. I could see a look on their face. I watched their countenance drop at Adrian's first whisker music fastball. I knew I watched them back up. I watched them look at me like, oh, I'm a little afraid. That's a fastball I've never seen. I'm not sure. And I think, yeah, you're going to get a steady diet of that, buddy, because I can see your weakness. I can see your flaw. I watch that Ramirez dig in there, and he hangs over that plate. It doesn't take his eyes off. He's got the face of a countenance of a lion. He said, I fear nothing. They feared not flood. They feared not the Jordan River. They feared nothing. Then they knew that they was not afraid of anything. And God said their countenance was a countenance of a lion. The sweat Swelling floods of the Jordan could not scare them. The what? The swelling floods of the Jordan? It means they're out of their banks. That means if you get in there, it may sweep you that way or sweep you under. That means when they're swelling out of their banks, that's not the right time to jump in the water. They didn't wait for perfect circumstances or favorable seasons, but they made circumstances subservient to their high purpose. Oh, God. Well, you know, I kind of have a burden for Honolulu. Sure, I like that pineapple. Fruit juices and fruit drinks. But how about a burden for Corinne? You seen them villages? I think I have a burden for Chino. You hearing me? See, conditions were subservient to them. They didn't say, I have to have hot water and running water and got to have electricity or I can't come to your country. I've been with so many preachers that over in Russia and different places. And the whole time you're there, wah, 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 wah. 
I want hot water. And there was no hot water. And there was no electricity. And I haven't had a bath in two weeks. And I just, I'll tell you what, I'll never come back here again. I know you won't. You'll drop out at the drop of a hat. Little old threat. The devil says boo and they're gone. Not these men. Why? They said, David is going to be my king. David is going to be the king of Israel. Let me tell you this morning, saints, is Christ going to be our king? Then every condition, everything he calls you and I to face, if he sends you there, he'll provide for you the necessary grace to come through it every time. He's God. He never says, stretch forth your hand if he's not going to heal you. He never says, get out of the boat if you're not going to walk on water. He's God. They turned difficulties into stepping stones of victory. They came up to that Jordan in the first month. When its waters had overflowed, they found on both banks of that river a strong army waiting for them. On the east bank and on the west bank. They met that enemy on that eastern shore, scattered them, then plunged into that swollen river, swam to the west banks, met another army. Again, they charged those foes, scattered them, and then they came to David victorious over flood and over foe. If you and I are going to make Jesus our king, saints, we cannot wait for favorable circumstances, nor be intimidated by the devil's growl. The best evidence that you and I are in God's will will often bring sudden difficulty. First time I went to Russia, you all know the story. KGB said, if you preach, we're going to kill you. Well, I went through a terrible time, but I, I got a breakthrough. I come back to that school of Christ and stand in that lobby. He's Brother Clendenin. He says, son, you had a pretty rough time, huh? I said, yes, sir. He said, just remember this, Duke Downs. If there wasn't a devil, you and I would be out of a job. I said, never heard that in my life. Only reason you ran into difficulty, because you're taking people out of the devil's kingdom. You're stirring up the devil's nest. Are you hearing me, saints? The best evidence is there'll be sudden difficulty or some fierce assault of that foe, some bitter trial of our faith. Paul began his great campaign to give the gospel to Europe, and the first place he found himself was in the Philippian jail with bleeding limbs and his feet fettered in stocks. But this church did not dismay Paul. Rather, he accepted it as a pledge of the devil's hate and the Father's love. Wow. He said, the devil must hate me, but I sure know God loves me. Because I used to be a murderer, and I'm laying in this jail not for murder. Not even for doing anything wrong, for doing everything right. What a way to be in jail. Prisoner for Jesus. Truly, honestly. And he says, I see this as the devil's hate, but I also see it as God's love. What a pledge. He rose up out of that Philippian jail, and I'm moving to close. And he went forward undismayed until all of Europe had received the gospel. And victory had been won in the face of every foe. God is preparing men and women today for the days of conflict, danger, and much trial as he is about to return church for his church. Let us not shrink back from this high call of making Jesus our King, but may God give us courage and make us brave enough to believe all this book declares. And I close with this, that we may testify to all that we believe, and then let us live all that we testify. Let us, O oh God, do what only others dream about. Let us do what most people talk about their whole life. When I get done with this job or this, this thing or that thing, then I'm going to give this go here, go there, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and they're still talking about it. 
God, let us do what others only talk about or dream about. And then let us glory in what others dare to do. My God. I looked at them villages. I said, Ginger, only God could send you. I see the brokenness of my son to leave his wife and kids and to go for times, weeks, sometimes months to reach a lost world only to do what most people talk about, dream about. I said to you a couple of weeks ago, I'm tired of playing church. I'm tired of talking about it. I want to do it. I want to see it. There's something in me driving me beyond my own ability. Last Sunday night in closing, you've seen the heaviness on my heart. Something was, was haunting me. Something was just pressuring me beyond words. I knew it was a lost world. When I made the altar call, I went around just laying hands on people. And when I'd lay hands on people, the Holy Spirit would show me exactly who they were praying for to be saved. I laid hands on a lot of people Sunday night. When I come by Nessa here, I just laid hands on her. And she told me what I said. I don't even remember saying it. I'm being honest. She said, you said, oh God, save her nieces and nephews. Her brother Tom was a backslidden preacher for many years. Broke the heart of his mom and daddy. But several months ago, he came back to God. Rededicated his life. And told his mom and dad, I don't know if I'll ever preach, but I know I'm going to live for God. And he started living and serving God. But he has a daughter, a niece, that's backslid. Doesn't know God. Monday night, he sat down on the couch. And he's gone. Instantly. They survived him with, with oxygen, but he was gone. When he hit the floor, he was gone. And this whole week, as he died Thursday night, but all the time Ness and Jack were there, they're dealing with that daughter that's unsaved. She's called them I don't know how many times since they got home, hooking up. You say, did Tom have to die for her to be saved? I don't know. I'm not going to play that. Only God knows. I know one thing, Tom's in heaven. But I love this story, so I get to tell it. But Monday morning, he died Monday night. Lived till Thursday on, on life support. But Monday morning, his mother, Sister Cramp, you all know her, called him and said, a week from Thursday, your dad and I are coming to visit you. We're going to spend two weeks. He said, Mom, can't wait. You can stay with me for four or five days. You can stay with Fred for a few days. And then you can stay with Gary. They all three brothers live in Arizona. He said, just have Teresa, my sister, bring mom and dad to Blythe and I'll come pick them up. But Kirk, he said, this is what he told his mom, his last words to his mother. He said, mom, when you get here, I'm going to treat you and dad like a king and a queen. I said, Nessa, do you realize how prophetic? When they get there, he's going to treat them like a king and a queen. They don't need to go to Arizona now for that. They'll meet him on streets of gold. He'll say, Mama, I thought you were coming to Buckeye, Arizona, but it was heaven that I must have been talking about. I'll treat you like a king and a queen. This morning, let's make Jesus king of our life. Maybe you've mistreated Him. Maybe you've turned your back on Him. Maybe you've made other things priorities. He used to be number one in your life. And saints of God, you hear this preacher, if He's not number one, you're not going to ever see Him face to face. 
If He's not Lord of your life, you will not see Him. I don't care how many times you read the Lord's Prayer or how much money you give to some kind of a charity or how much you may pray over your food. If Jesus is not your Savior and your Lord, then He's not your King. Bow your heads as the choir comes. Holy Spirit, I preached what I know you gave me. I know I've spoke for your very heart and your very thought and your very mind. Holy Spirit, what a privilege. What a privilege that you would anoint this piece of clay to speak to people. Maybe a day, a week, a month. Who knows from your soon return. But God, don't let one person let this message fall on deaf ears. God, there's some here with a broken heart. I have to say, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt they're not ready to meet you. But God, you brought them here by divine appointment. You brought them here just to tell them you still love them. You still are pouring out your grace and your mercy. You're still reaching for them. Let today be the day that they crown you with their own life and may tomorrow be a day we crown you with others' lives. Holy Spirit, I spoke my heart. I've done my absolute best to do what you asked me to do. Now don't let this word fall to the ground. But like Samuel, you heard these words. You said you wouldn't let them fall to the ground. Save, save, save. Over this house, you're here. It's not what it once was with you and God. There was a time hot tears would run down your cheek when you would watch a video of a missionary field. And today you cannot even bat an eye or shed a tear the loss don't mean to you what it once meant you know why you lost yourself today's your day obey the spirit of God nobody knew last Sunday that Tom Cramp was going to church for his last time if you've seen him in person probably one of the most healthy men you'd ever look at Today he's in heaven because he made the right choice. Today's your day to make the right choice, to make Jesus king. Would you just stand to your feet over this house? And as they begin to sing, I don't want to beg you. I don't want to force you. I want you to choose. Jesus, you're going to be my king. I'm going to make you king of my life. Would you come?